my name is Kelsey Ruling and I am from California, which is part of the former Tulare Lake Basin, um, but now unfortunately the Upper Kauia Reservoir. Uh, and I um, am here to talk a little bit about salamanders and my research project or future research project on salamanders. So throughout this class we heard from presenters who have shared their understanding of the basin um, and I've heard testimonies from individuals who lived on the Ha and the Cape Fear about how their streams have been have been degraded whether through urbanization or industrialization um, and I was introduced to salamanders last spring in my ecology class Hillary Schultz who was a former member of the seminar did a research project on salamanders and their effect on or and used them as a bioindicator for stream health and I thought that was so cool and we had a lab where we just sat in the stream and got to turn over rocks and find salamanders um, and I was in heaven. I thought that was absolutely fun. The most fun thing ever. So I wanted to continue Hillary's project and I so I re proposed that to my mm, my biology professor and she put me in touch with Ken Bridal who has really been my mentor throughout this entire process and he introduced me to the idea of impervious surfaces. So this is a key word here, folks. And I'm going to try and explain it really well. Um, but I'm going to come back to, I'm going to keep coming back to it. So impervious surfaces are rooftops, they're um, parking lots, anything like a hardened structure that isn't, that when rain falls, the water isn't able to absorb. So this would be in contrast to like a forested, um, forested landscape. So you have this idea of like a sponge and then this idea of something like glass that water isn't able to penetrate. So the big idea with impervious surfaces is that when rain hits, we have a big rainfall in North Carolina, water isn't able to soak up into the soil and then gradually make its way to the stream. Instead, it rushes into the stream and you have sedimentation in the stream, you have erosion because of this strong influx of water. Okay, so that's kind of the idea of impervious surfaces. You can see that they're pretty, they can be really degrading to a stream ecosystem. So um, now I kind of want to share my process of ultimately I want to be a marine biologist, but I'm here in the Piedmont um, in landlocked North Carolina. So I'm going to share how, how marine biology can, took me to this salamander. So, um, in summer 2013, I studied abroad in Bonaire, which is an island off the coast of Venezuela. Um, I got to go scuba diving every day, I took a course in marine ecology, and I absolutely fell in love. This is ultimately what I want to do. Um, I want to be underwater, I want to be studying those coral reefs and protecting them. They're absolutely, they're incredibly understudied um, and are subject to our impact every single day. So. Um, um, so uh, yeah, this is what I want to be doing. So then I got that idea and the next summer, this past summer, I knew I wanted to work with marine animals. Um, I applied to the Greensboro Science Center as an aquarium intern and these were some of the daily activities that I got to do. So I'm feeding Lex Luthor, who's a six foot sandbar shark on one side, and then I'm waking up a cow nose raised from anesthesia because um, she in underwent a procedure, a medical procedure. So. Those are just some of my daily activities. That was a 10 week, um, 10 week internship, got credit for it. So much fun. Um, but one of my most um, exciting and memorable experiences this summer was working on the behavioral husbandry plan for Silver Surfer, who's a spotted eagle ray. Um, I'd seen, so I got to feed him, I got to touch him, I got to play with him. And I'd seen these rays when I was scuba diving in Bonaire, um, but they're really, really elusive creatures. You would be, like, I mean, way, way far away. And, oh, do you see the ray? Okay. Um, but, like, that was as close as we got. We did not get close to these guys at all, but I got to, I got to touch him. So, like, it was so exciting. And they're incredibly smart, and it just, like, motivated me to want to protect their ecosystems even more because I had this connection with him. So, um... So I brought my love for, for marine animals and my idea of wanting to protect their environments or really any aquatic environments and I brought it back to Guilford. 
Um, and so that's how I got to my project on salamanders. And also Hillary, who introduced to me this I love for sitting in the stream and playing with salamanders. Um, and I chose salamanders are particularly good bioindicators of stream health because they're so pollution intolerant. Um, I mean, doesn't that guy look kind of fragile and delicate? Uh, so he, so salamanders, and the Piedmont is particularly rich in salamander diversity. Um, we have a lot, a lot of different types of salamanders and a huge population. And so, because we have this huge population, they're incredibly important to the stream ecosystem. They are some of, in like smaller streams, they're some of the top predators. There's no fish in those streams. These are the guys that are really controlling the food web. So a loss of them would totally devastate those stream ecosystems. Um, uh, so now I'm going to go into how I am going to stress, this, ooh, assess stream health. Uh, so I'm using a number of different parameters. I'm going to use the Army Corps of Engineers stream assessment. So that's basically a worksheet that helps me understand the appearance or assess the appearance of my sites. I'm going to map and analyze different watersheds, so talk about look at impervious surfaces and how many or what the area is versus the forested area in my watersheds. I'll look at agriculture if there's any and how that could be affecting my site, my, the site where I'm collecting salamanders and doing benthics. And then I'm going to do this benthic. So this is a stonefly larva here. This is in a, an ice cube tray. So can you imagine this guy's like this big, pretty tiny. Um, but I get in the stream, a benthic sample can, um, includes like getting in the stream and like disturbing a lot of rocks and having a net below. So catching all the little bugs that I've now disturbed, um, IDing them, picking them out, and looking at them and deciding um, whether they, uh, are, um, they can be a really good indicator of stream health because obviously having life in the stream is important. And these guys serve as salamander food. So if you don't have benthics, then you really don't have salamanders or any sort of macroinvertebrates. So, and then my final, my final parameter is a pebble count. So I talked about impervious surfaces and how that equals to, that equals, or a lot of impervious surfaces equals a lot of stormwater runoff. Um, so being able to um, look at the pebble count and kind of that is a good indicator of how much urbanization is going on above my watershed, I mean above my stream site, and whether it's a good habitat for salamanders or benthics. So I have four sites, two of which are in the Cape Fear River Basin. One is in the Guilford Woods. Um, you can see this is our our lake right there and my stream site is at the the very point of that blue um, area and it's about 90 my stream site is about 90 acres and it's part urbanized and part um, forested as you can see here there's kind of the forested area on top and the residential on the bottom so about 40 40 percent of the area is impervious surfaces and then at the edge of Price Park which is just down the road um, I have another street, another sample site, which is again about about 50 acres, both residential and urbanized. Um, and you can see here there is some forested area, but also some residential. So about 40% of the watershed is impervious. And then I have two more sample sites, both in the Roanoke River Basin. Um, the first is Indian Creek at Hanging Rock State Park. So I, these are kind of different maps, but if you can imagine, if you've ever been to Hanging Rock, it's pretty forested. Um, so this is one of my most pristine site. I would expect that there would be a high number of salamanders and a really rich and diverse benthic population because there's only one parking lot, three buildings, and some trails as opposed to the you know 300 buildings that are in the other uh, sample sites. And then my fourth is the Night Brown Nature Preserve. Um, so this dark green area is protected land and my sample site is within this protected land, but a watershed does not just constitute a small area. All the water from these surrounding areas drains into that river. So, and over here you have some roads um, as well as residential area and agriculture. 
So about 50% of that is impervious, even though my sample site is within this protected area. So this, this semester has really been um, me working on my techniques. Field studies is, um, as some, can be incredibly biased. And I'm trying to avoid that with developing consistency. So I, so one of my first um, preliminary data collections was at Price Park down the street and I did a pebble count. So don't get alarmed by the graph. Um, I will explain. Uh, it can be a little bit daunting, but what you need to know or what is really important is to look at the steepest area of the graph. So that's about like right here. You have kind of the most, the steepest increase between two dots. Um, and that indicates that I found the most pebbles of that particular size. Um, or I found the most pebbles that fell into that particular category. Um, so that's about two to four millimeters. And, and that's good. And as you can see, this graph is pretty stable. There's no like sharp increases anywhere. Um, and that is kind of an indicator that, that the stream is kind of balanced. There's some small pebbles, there's some large rocks. So ultimately it's a pretty decent habitat and it's not too affected by urbanization, as I can tell from this parameter. Um, what you don't want to see would be a really, really sharp increase at the beginning and that would, that would indicate that there's like a lot of sand and probably a fair number of impervious surfaces that are causing this small sediment. Okay, so my second um, preliminary data was also at Price Park and I sampled some benthics and there's a list of the different organisms that I found and I kind of grouped them into different ranges as far as some are more pollution tolerant and some are more intolerant. And um, getting ahead of myself. Um, so, so as you can see, it's like pretty diverse. I found some that are pretty pollution intolerant and some that are really pollution tolerant. So that's good. I can't, you, from the benthic samples, it's a little bit hard to say whether the stream at habitat is really affected by the urbanization that's upstream. Um, had I only found organisms that really fall into group three, I could then say that, look, this stream is incredibly um, impacted by the urbanization and therefore not really conducive for a diverse um, life <coughs> habitat. And finally, um, the salamanders. So uh, I have horrible note card system. Um, so like I said before, the Piedmont, which is this area in between the mountains and the, and the ocean, is incredibly high in salamander diversity and richness. Um, and that also means that these guys are really important to the stream habitats. And losing them would devastate the streams. So, um, so which is why I want to study them. Ultim I mean, they, they have a huge impact on the streams and a loss of, a loss of salamanders is, would be um, pretty devastating. So, and they're also pollution intolerant. Um, and that's because a large number of the larvae, which I have an example of one up there, spend their time in the stream. So if the stream has a lot of pollution or if there isn't a good benthics or, or macroinvertebrates for them to eat, they're not gonna have a healthy adult population. Um, so a little bit, I have two different um, species here. We have northern duskies and then a three-line salamander. Those were all found in the Guilford Woods. So you go back out there, you could find some salamanders yourself. Um, and ultimately, as I mentioned before, this semester was really me just laying the groundwork. Maya talked about being a historical researcher. Um, this is a project that I'm going to continue in the following year. I'm going to contract it as an independent research project, and I'm going to go out to those sample sites again and again and again and look at the different um, life stages of salamanders as well as see if see the, the different types of um, impacts that urbanization has on the stream health. So this is an open invitation. If you ever want to go play in the streams, um, just let me know. And do y'all have any questions about salamanders, about streams, about my any 
Anything that I, yes? Did you find like a, a bunch of salamanders? Um, I found a good number. We even went out to the woods and I did a little demo for like in a minute or two and we found a, a, a couple <coughs> salamanders. But yeah, there's, I've been finding even in the urbanized areas, there's a pretty um, healthy population. I wouldn't say they're incredibly diverse. I'm finding about one or two species, which is okay, but that also could have to do with the season. Um, there's some that spend their time in the stream in the fall, and then there's others that um, spend their time in the stream in the spring, let's say, when they're laying eggs. So it could kind of be a seasonal thing as well. How many salamander species do you think are would be in the um, there's a pretty healthy list. Um, the, it could, it is probably about 20 or so. <coughs> but like Hillary, when she did her project, she found about four or five different. Um, so I'm hoping to get to that number at one site. Hopefully, probably Hanging Rock <coughs> is my guess. Yeah. Have you uh, thought about comparing research you've done compared to what Hillary found? Yeah, I have her research. Um, her research project and her paper on it. And that was kind of my baseline. And so she did a number of different sample sites. I'm hoping to repeat mine um, a couple more times than she did. She only got to go out in the field a few times, obviously because she was constrained to this kind of one semester of work. Um, and I'm hoping to extend mine into about a year pro project. So any other questions? You guys want to get that internship? Does that look fun? That was really good.